Good morning, RFA Church family. Man, I, th- I was sitting right over there and listening to y'all sing and worship. It blessed my day. Y'all are absolutely incredible. And look, first service, we didn't have that. First service, something went on with our uh, lyrics, and so there were no lyrics, and nobody sang. I thought uh, Governor Gavin Newsom was running our PowerPoint or something because nobody was singing. But, uh, but man, to hear y'all praise the Lord Jesus Christ, this is my favorite place to be. Last week, we were gone on vacation, and the whole time, you know, Darlene, I said, I mean this, whole time we were on vacation, Darlene said, I wish you were back at RFA Church. This is our favorite place to be on a Sunday morning. I'd be here even if you didn't pay me. Don't test me on that, but I'd be here even if you didn't pay me. And so it's great to have you here today. And um, this is a tough passage we're going to be going through today. Um, I've been struggling with this all week. Last week, my wife and daughter ganged up on me. They said, what are you preaching on on Sunday? I said, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, because we've been going through 1 Corinthians. They said, don't do that. They said, that's a hard chapter. It's not a happy chapter. I said, look, I don't know how they do it here in Raleigh, but back in Rowan County, where I'm from, chapter 5 comes after chapter 4, so we got to do it, okay? So if you would, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and uh, as you're turning there, just listen to me. We're going to talk about holiness and purity in the body of Christ today, and that is not a popular, urbane thing to be talking about. We want to talk about social justice and feeding the poor and the widows and the orphans and all that. We don't want to talk about holiness. That's passe. Okay. I want you to look at this. Hold your place there in 1 Corinthians 5. I want you to look at this. James chapter 1, verse 27. Because in the old days, we had men who preached the Bible and they preached verses like, Be ye holy, for I am holy, says the Lord. Come out from among them and be separate. We don't preach that anymore. Again, it's all about social stuff today and not about holiness. Here's what James says in James chapter 1, verse 27. Hey, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this. So here's pure religion. To look after orphans and widows in their distress. That's the social stuff. We ought to be doing that. But then he says this. And... To keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Do you see what he's saying? He's saying we got to do both. Let's keep feeding the hungry. We do that every week here at RFA Church. Let's help out the widows. We do that every week at RFA Church. Let's make people's lives better. Let's do that, but don't forget that we're to be holy and unstained by this world. And so today in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, I want you to see how seriously God takes sin open flagrant sin in the church first corinthians chapter 5 verse 1 paul says this and look i don't know any other way to do this but just kind of work through this whole passage verse by verse today can we do that because it's a hard passage honestly i like now y'all don't think this i actually true people say well pastor you're so bold and confident when you get in the pulpit i'm not a bold confident person in my flesh i'm weak and i want people to like me i'll be honest with you and so i want to do a sermon that makes everybody happy uh i want to be joel osteen on steroids you know how but if I'm going to preach the whole counsel of God, I've got to preach this. 1 Corinthians 5, 1. Now, keep in mind, Paul planted a church in the city of Corinth, and Corinth was a horrible city. In fact, I think I read somewhere there were like 10,000 prostitutes that kind of plied their trade in Corinth. Everybody went to a prostitute. That's just what you did. And in fact, the city was so degenerate that the Greco-Roman world had a word for pervert. Do you know what that word was? Corinthian. Honestly, if you live, live in the uh, Greco-Roman world and you want to call somebody a pervert, you just call them a Corinthian. That's how messed up the city was. And Paul says this, it is actually reported that there's sexual immorality among you in, in the church at Corinth and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles that a man has his father's wife. Now, the verbiage in the Greek, basically, if you look at this, what Paul is basically saying, there's a man in the church that's married to a woman, okay? And she is probably not a Christian. A man married to a woman, and uh, she is having an affair with a young man in the church who is a Christian. And it is the the son of this man. This man is having an affair with his stepmother is what's going on here, okay? And uh, Paul seems to be concerned about the fact that this report is reaching the lost world. He says, it is reported. In other words, this isn't just contained in the church. Now outside the church are hearing about this. And he says, it's not even named among the Gentiles. 
even lost people outside the church are shocked at what's going on in the church. Hey, folks, we've had about a 20-year experiment in the body of Christ of trying to reach the world by being like the world, acting like the world, having the values of the world. We have this weird idea that to reach the world, we've got to be like them. We've been trying it, and that experiment has failed. Across the board, every a metric is going down. Church attendance is going down. Salvations are going down. I've told you this for the last 20 years. We don't change the world by trying to be like the world. I've never met somebody that says, I was a, um, a materialistic sexual degenerate, and then at work, I met this guy. He was really cool. He was a materialistic sexual degenerate, and he was a Christian, and I decided I wanted to be like him. Hey, you're already like him. The people who reach people for Jesus Christ are those, and they said this, I went to work, and there's this guy. His values were different than my values. He treated people differently than why I treated people. We all went out and partied and got drunk, and he didn't. And I thought, man, there's a peace about him that I want, and I wanted to be like him. That reaches the world for Jesus Christ. And Paul says, he says, the outside world, church, is looking at the things you're tolerating, and you're destroying your witness. Look at this, verse 2. And you are puffed up. In other words, you're proud and arrogant of your open-mindedness. That's the American church right there. We are proud because we tolerate absolutely everything. Paul says you are proud because you're tolerating your sin. Paul is rebuking a church that says we're a little bit different than the other Christians. We're not these crazy fundamentalist Christians. We're a little bit more open-minded. Paul says you're you're proud in your open-mindedness. I'm going to tell you something. Uh, Well, look, we're just coming out of the month of June, and it was Pride Month, Gay Pride Month. Okay. I'll I'll be honest with you. Can we do something next year here at RFA Church? I'm going to take this from another friend of mine who pastors his church. Can y'all remind me, next June at RFA Church, it's going to be Jesus Pride Month. We're going to take pride in Jesus Christ, who he is, what he's done for us, the fact that he's King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Paul says your, your pride is misplaced. You're proud on your open-mindedness. This whole Pride Month reminds me that the Bible says their glory is in their shame. Um, Y'all, let me just time out. Y'all know there's no way we're going to be able to stay on Fox 50, right? Okay, just enjoy it while you can. There's no way they're going to keep us on there. So listen to this. Pride is the original sin. Uh, In Isaiah chapter 14, five times Satan says, I will ascend to the throne of heaven. I will become like God. I, I I, and Paul says that same demonic pride is now in the church because you have a man that is living in open sin. He's not repenting, and your pride is misplaced. Let's keep going. Verse 2, and you are puffed up and have not rather mourned. Listen to me. My response in my flesh when When there's open immorality in the church. Now, you keep in mind, what's not happening here is a man having an affair with a stepmother. They confront him as a follower of Jesus says, man, I'm so sorry. I repent. God have mercy on my soul. That's not what's happening here. They're encouraging this. He's not repenting. And he says, you should have mourned. When there's open sin in the body of Christ, in my flesh, I get angry. Okay? Paul doesn't say get angry. Um. Something like this, you have to admit there's an ick factor in this, icky, okay? Paul doesn't say your response is be disgusted. What does Paul say your response should be? You should mourn and weep over a brother in Jesus Christ that is destroying his life. We practice church discipline here at RFA Church. So I'm going to just give you full disclosure. If you become part of this fellowship and you're living in open immorality we're going to love you we're going to go to you we're going to try to get you to repent but if you don't repent we remove you from the fellowship why because we hate you no because we love you if i love you and i see you with a bottle of green liquid with skull and crossbones on it and you're putting it to your lips the most unloving thing i can do is say not my business he can make his own choices i'm not going to judge him the most loving thing i can do is slap that out of your hand And Paul says to this church, you need to mourn because this man is destroying his testimony and he is destroying his life. Church, you need to understand, sometimes God, hey, y'all believe God still disciplines us? Y'all believe that? 
Because there's a lot of verses you're going to have to take out of the Bible if you don't believe God still disciplines us. Those whom he loves, he disciplines. And part of God's discipline, many times, is turning us over to the very sin we refuse to repent of. Romans 1, 26, it says this, For this reason, God gave them over. Look, there's something built into sin. At first, it's fun, and then it stops being fun, and it's destructive. I love this old quote. Sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. And that's what was happening to this man. He was destroying his life. And Paul says, if you love this man, you do something about it. You should be mourning. Uh, I read this thing years ago. There was a king back in the 1300s. His name was uh, King Reynald, and he was morbidly obese. And one day, King Reynald's brother, Edward, brought an army against Reynald's army and defeated Reynald's army, and he, he captured his obese brother, took him to the Newkirk Castle, and put him in this special stone room that he had made, like a little prison cell. It was very interesting. King Edward left a door about that wide there in that castle. And he said to his overweight brother, he says, you're not my prisoner. You can leave anytime you want. The door is open. But Reynold was so big, he couldn't squeeze through that. Now, if he had just not eat for a little while and lose some weight, he could shimmy through that. But then here's what his brother did so cruel. His brother every day would have people come and leave big old casseroles right outside the door there. Big old apple pies outside the door. Barbecue outside the door. Five guys burgers. Can y'all tell us about getting lunchtime? Let's get out of here, man. And he would leave all this stuff out, and his brother would just, just gobble it up. And for 10 years, he could get out if he wanted to, but he couldn't squeeze through. Why? Because he was a prisoner of his appetite. And what happens in the body of Christ is the little sin that we kind of play with, and we think that we can toy with it, and we think we can manage it, it soon manages us and keeps us in prison. And Paul says, if you love this guy, you'd be mourning over the choices he's making. Look at this. That he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I, indeed, as absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged as though I were present. Paul says, look, I know the facts and I've already passed judgment. I guess Paul didn't read that part, judge not lest ye be judged. Can I tell you, our, there, our culture only knows one Bible verse. You know what it is? Judge not lest you be judged. He says, I already judged this guy uh, who has done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan, look at this, for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Those are powerful words right there. Paul says, here's what I want you to do, church. Y'all give him a chance to repent. He's not repenting. So here's what I want you to do. Next time y'all gather, you turn this man over to Satan and say, you are no longer under the spiritual covering of this church. We now remove you from this fellowship. I'll tell you something. Satan, you understand Satan and God are not equals, right? Okay. Satan really submits to God. And God sometimes uses Satan to discipline other human beings. And Paul says this man needs a wake-up call and turn him over to Satan, and maybe Satan will slap him around a little bit and beat the fire out of him, and when he finally hits rock bottom, maybe he'll turn to God. I, I've had to do that before. I, you know, I did years ago. I was pastoring in another church in another town, a little small town, and uh, I was getting my hair cut one day, back when I had hair, and the barbers were cutting my hair, and they kept talking about this deacon in my church. Well, how's deacon so-and-so? And they kind of snicker. I was deacon so-and-so, and I finally said, well, time out. What's going on with deacon so-and-so in my church? And they said, you know what's going on. I said, actually, I don't. They said, he's living with his girlfriend. I said, excuse me? Yes, a deacon in your church is living with his girlfriend. And I went and I confronted that deacon. And here's what, very nice. He said, I am. I'm living with my girlfriend. And I'm not going to step down as a deacon, and I'm not leaving this church. And I said, actually, you are on both counts. And I brought him before the fellowship, and I said, we are now removing this man from the church because he, he refuses to repent. And I think for about, I think it was three months. For three months, I don't know what happened, but when we handed him over to Satan, physically, he started to have some problems. Financially, he started to have some problems. 
mentally and emotionally, he started having some problems. And after several months, he came back and he says, I'm moving out. I'm leaving this lady. I'm getting right with the Lord Jesus. Will y'all forgive me? And you know what we did? We took it from the story of the prodigal son. When the prodigal son came back to the father, what did the father do? He threw a party. When that man came back, we threw a party for him at the church, and we welcomed him back into the fellowship. <laughs> Mission accomplished. Look, and See, here's what happens. Paul says, do it with this guy. I want you to, to, to turn him over to Satan. You do the same thing. We're not sure what happened with this guy, but evidently between 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, Satan did mess with this guy. His life was miserable. And in 2 Corinthians, uh, evidently this guy has come back to the church and he says, I'm sorry. And the church says, man, you, you stay out. You're not welcome back here. And Paul says, no. He says, look, this is restorative, not punitive. When the guy repents, bring him back into the fellowship. Does that make sense? And so that's what's going on here. So I want you to see this. L let's keep going a little bit further. Verse 6. He says, hey, church. Your glorying is not good. This pride that you have, we're a little bit more open-minded than this church down the street. We're open and tolerant. He says, that's not a good thing. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump, the whole thing of dough? Therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ is... Our Passover was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. What in the world is he talking about? Well, Paul is a Jew. And here's what you understand. Yeast or leaven in the Bible is often um, symbolic of evil, bad stuff. And so here's what the Jews do once a year. They have a festival called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Have you heard of that? And what Jews will do, in fact, I think Jews today will do this. They'll go through their house, and anything that has yeast or leaven in it, they get rid of. Donuts, croissants, bread, pasta, it's getting lunch time. They'll get all this stuff, and anything that has yeast, they throw it out of the house. And in fact, somebody said they'll actually go to their cooking utensils and scald their cooking utensils. They'll burn anything that might have even touched bread because there's to be no leaven in the house. And when all the leaven is taken out, then they, um, they celebrate the Passover supper. And Paul says, church, I want you to do the same thing. There is sin in this church. It is destroying the body of Christ. I want you to do what we Jews do with the leaven. I want you to remove this corrupting influence from out of the church. Because he's destroying the body of Christ. Hey, now look, we, we don't know. Most of us don't bake bread. Unless you're homeschoolers like me and Darla, you don't make your own bread, churn your own goat's milk to make butter, and wear doilies on your head. So you don't know what bread is. So let me give you something different. We, we uh, thought about this. I've got a thing of water right here, okay? Forget about the, the bread leaven thing. Here's, here's another illustration. I love water. Honestly, water... It is the best thirst quencher in the world, better than Coca-Cola, anything like that. So good, fresh, clean water tastes great. Now, here's what I did this morning. I'm not going to say, now, pretend like this is toilet water. To make this real, and I will wash my hands after the sermon if y'all want to come shake my hand, but just to make this real, I legitimately did this. I went to a toilet here at RFA Church, and I got toilet water in here, okay? All right? Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to look at this. This nice, clean water, I'm just going to put one, two, I'm just going to put three drops of toilet water in here and shake it up. Okay, now do you want to drink it? You want to drink this thing? No, 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 no. Hey, hey, it's 99% clean. There's only three drops of toilet water in there. <laughs> what has just happened? A little bit of impurity has now negated the purity of the whole. And Paul is saying, church, you're tolerating this filth in your midst, whether you know it or not. It is now defacing the bride of Jesus Christ. You are now diluting the purity of the bride of Jesus Christ. That's what he's saying. You've got to get rid of this. D does that make sense? Okay, so I'm going to put this back up, and I'm actually, because a lot of times I'll absentmindedly drink, I'm going to put this as far away as I can, because I do not want to accidentally drink this thing, Okay. <laughs> So that's what Paul is saying. Now, no, keep going a little bit further now. Look, verses 9 through 13, 
These are, these are hard verses for me to read. And it's even harder to live out. You're not going to like what I'm about to read. If, if you don't like what I say, I want you to email the Apostle Paul at whatever his email address is, okay? If you don't like what the Apostle Paul says, I want you to go to Matthew 18 and listen to the words of Jesus because Jesus says the same thing. Jesus, the Son of God, says the same thing Paul's saying right here. Look at this. I wrote to you in my epistle, which means there's actually a letter he wrote to the Corinthian church before even 1 Corinthians. We, we just don't have that letter. Not to keep company with sexually immoral people. He says this. Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world, those outside the church, or the covetous or extortioners or idolaters. Since then, you'd, you'd have to go out of the world. Do you see what he's saying? He said, when I told you, don't hang around sexually perverted people. He says, I don't mean out in the world where you work. Because then you just have to leave the world. They're out there. Verse 11. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. For what have I to do with judging those also who are outside. Do you not judge those who are inside, but those who are outside? God judges. Therefore, put away from yourselves the evil person. That's how seriously the Lord takes this thing. Here's what he's saying. Again, if I'm reading this correctly, if you work with a guy who is cheating on his wife on Saturday night, openly and he says but i'm a deacon at my local church on sunday morning let's go do a little golfing outing you can't go golfing with him because he claims to be a brother in jesus christ but he's living a sexually immoral lifestyle is this microphone on because it's getting real quiet okay that means if you say this person over here is my best friend. We went to youth camp together. She got saved the same time I got saved. And now she's partying and living like hell every Saturday night. And she's cheating on her husband. And, but we're still good friends. And Paul says, you can't do that. Unless I'm reading this thing wrong. Paul says, sin is so serious. There's such a corrupting influence in sin that if you're not careful, here's what the Bible says, take heed to yourself lest ye you fall. And church... Because we are not taking this mandate to be holy as he is holy, because we have played it fast and loose morally, because we are laughing at things that our forefathers blushed at, because we are following bloggers and following this and following that online and posting all kinds of filth, and we think it's funny, because of that, the church has lost its power. Listen to me. The problem is not that the sinners sin. Sinners are supposed to sin. That's why we call them sinners. The problem is not that sinners sin. The problem is the saints who are not supposed to be like the sinning sinners are sometimes more sinful than the sinning sinners that are supposed to sin. Do I need to repeat that? I'm going to tell you something. If we don't take this thing of purity and holiness seriously, now I'm not talking about perfection. Look at this. Look at here. This man right here sins every day, every single day. And when I sin and the Spirit of God convicts me, I ask, God, I'm sorry, I fumbled that ball. Not because not I can go to heaven. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to heaven. Even though I sin every day, I'm going to heaven. But every day I sin. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about living in open, unrepentant sin. If you and I keep playing it loose morally, it impacts two things. Jot this down. Number one, it impacts the presence Let's just put it this way. You will not experience the manifest presence of God in your life or in your family or in your home as long as you're playing it loose morally. You can't pump sewer into your house and then wonder why the Shekinah glory of God does not settle around your house. You can't spend more time in front of the Babylonian idiot box laughing at perverse things than you do in the Word of God and then wonder why God doesn't show up in your house. We as a church can't tolerate filth and then wonder why are we not seeing signs, wonders, and miracles anymore. Does it make sense? Okay. I, uh, I love this verse. The psalmist says in Psalm 24, Hey, God, right, let me ask you this question, God. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in your holy place? And then the psalmist answers his own question. He who has clean hands and a pure heart. A couple years ago, <laughs> many years ago, when Don and I went to college, 
we, we went to this thing. It wasn't like a prom. I don't know what they call it, spring formal or something like that, where she bought this really nice dress. I rented a tuxedo. We went out with another couple. It's supposed to be a big night, okay? And we went down to South Carolina to a place called, y'all remember this place called Steak and Ale? Y'all remember Steak and Ale? I don't know if they still exist or not, but we went to this, this restaurant called Steak and Ale. It's supposed to be really nice. Dressed up, gussied up. And when we got there, I ordered, okay, or escargot. You know what escargot is? Snails. Their snails are about that big, okay? They were escargot that had been cooked in garlic butter, strong garlic butter. And Darla said, Chad, when we got back in that car, every time you exhaled, it was like green smoke was coming out of your mouth. It was so nasty. And I wonder why that even I wanted to dance with her. She didn't want to dance with me. She's like, stay away. I love you. I'm not going to break up with you. We're still boyfriend, girlfriend, or fiance, whatever. But just stay away from me. You stink. She did not want to be anywhere near me. Why? Because I had eaten something that absolutely disgusted her. And here's what God says. You're my born-again child. I love you. You're going to heaven but I don't want to be near you. You are dealing with things and you're toying with things that are antithetical to my presence. And as long as you're toying with this stuff and you think it's cute and funny and you're tolerating it, I love you, but my presence won't go with you. And the second thing I think that is impacted when you and I start playing it loose morally, not only presence, but power. Power. Folks, l- listen to me. I'm not saying this to feel sorry for us, no. Draw and I were talking the other day. We have experienced more spiritual warfare in the last couple of months than any time we can ever remember. And I thought it was just us. What are we doing? Something wrong? And so we talked to other pastors of other churches. She was talking to a pastor's wife just the other day, and that pastor's wife at a pretty solid church, a very influential church, said the same thing. We are experiencing more spiritual warfare than we've ever experienced. I'm going to tell you, church. Without the power of the Holy Spirit, I don't know how we're going to stand in these last days. It's not going to be by might. It's not going to be by power. It's going to be by the, by the Spirit of the living God. Without the whole, I'm just going to say it again. Without the Holy Spirit, we're not going to have the power to stand up in these last days. But He is the what Spirit? Holy Spirit. And you grieve Him. You've got to make a choice, okay? You can grieve Him by watching filth, laughing at filth, playing it loose morally and not have the manifest power of the Holy Spirit. Or you can say, maybe I'm going to walk with clean hands and a pure heart and tap into that power of the Holy Spirit, but you can't have it both ways. In fact, you know what a swamp is? You think about a swamp. Okay. There's no power in a swamp. It's dirty, smelly, dead. It just exists. But you take that swamp and you pull it between two banks, and suddenly that swamp becomes a river. And that river is powerful. And the steeper the banks, the more powerful that river is. And it can turn turbines. It can do incredible things. A swamp is basically a river without boundaries. And I'm saying to you, you can live a swamp existence with no power, no strength, or you can have some strong moral boundaries. And the stronger those moral boundaries are, the more power you have to do incredible things for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I just believe... Hey, we ask God this all the time. We're, i got to hurry up here, but we ask God this all the time. Well, we're in a Pentecostal church. I read the book of Acts. Why don't we see dead people raised like they did back then? Why don't we see the lame walk like they did back then? Why don't we see demons cast out like they did back then? And I wonder if God said, you're waiting on me. And God said, I'm actually waiting on you to get your act together because I will not empower a group of unholy people who play it loose morally. You want the power of my presence? You're going to have purity in your midst. You with me? All right. Let's close this thing down. So here's my question. All right. How, how do I get that motivation for purity? In, in other words, there is a draw. It's almost like an undertow at the beach. There is this draw that the world has, imperceptible. It, it draws me away from Jesus. How do I fight the pull of this filthy, perverted world? D- does that make sense? I've got this world pulling at me. What motivates me to stay pure? Can I tell you what Pastor Chad Harvey has been dealing with the last couple of days? Here's what's been helping me with this thing. First John chapter 3, verse 3. 
the more I focus on this, the less the world has this pull and attraction to me. 1 John chapter 3, verse 3, it says this. Now, here's my little secret. It'll help you out. And all who have this eager expectation in context, you know what that eager expectation is in the context? It's the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everybody who lives in an eager expectation that Jesus is coming back. Hey, can I ask y'all a question? Y'all believe Jesus is coming back? Y'all believe he's forgotten about us? No. Could it be today? Yes. All who live with this eager expectation of the return of Christ will keep themselves pure just as he is pure. John is saying this. He said, look, the more you think about heavenly things and the return of Jesus Christ, the less pull this world has on you. It's kind of like, how many of y'all here had maybe an old granny, Pentecostal granny, or maybe an old Southern Baptist granny, and uh, they would say things like this. Hey, you going out to the movies tonight? Yeah, we're going to the movies. Hey, is that where you want to be found when Jesus comes back at that movie? Did you ever hear something like that? Hey, you, honey, you going out with that man tonight, that no good man? Yeah, I'm going to go out with him tonight. Is that where you want Jesus to find you when he comes out on a date with that guy? You know, and so sometimes that was unhealthy, but there's a nugget of truth here. When I realize Jesus is coming back and we're talking about eternal things, suddenly the world just doesn't have the pull that it used to have. I think it was the old Puritan Thomas Brooks that said this. You cannot have lunch with Satan and then sit down at the marriage supper of the Lamb and dine with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And church, I'm not trying to scare well, I am. I'm trying to scare you right now. The signs are coming together. Do you know the Bible term for COVID-19? It's pestilence. We are seeing a global pestilence visiting the world like the bible talked about i don't want to get into this too much but remember i told y'all last year and some of y'all laughed at me remember i told y'all last year when when governor andrew cuomo signed that bill making abortion legal without restrictions and they lit up the empire state building in pink and now even babies who are born alive can be killed i said don't think we can just get away with that and i was right we have pestilence jesus says nation will rise against nation told you this before in greek it's ethne ethnic group will rise up against ethnic group jesus says another sign of the end times is ethnic racial wars second thessalonians says a sign that you're living in the last days is anarchy throughout the land what else does god have to do to tell us the time is short Jesus is coming back. And when you start studying and praying about and thinking about the blessed return of the Lord Jesus Christ, 1 John 3, 3 says, all those who have this expectation will keep themselves pure. Let me close with this. Robert Robbins was an Air Force pilot during the first Iraq war. After his 300th mission, Robbins was told he could go home. So he decided to surprise his family. He flew from the Middle East to Massachusetts and drove all night to surprise his family. When he pulled into the driveway, he saw a huge banner out front of his house. His kids were up and dressed. His wife, her hair was fixed. She was wearing a new, beautiful dress. And they're overwhelmed. And he says to his wife, the banner, the hair, the dress, the kids, how did you know I was coming back today? I didn't, she answered through tears of joy. Once we knew the war was over, we knew you'd be home one of these days. We knew you'd try to surprise us, so we were ready for you every day. I'm going to tell you something. A war has been fought. The Savior is victorious. And he is going to try to surprise us. And I want me and this church to be waiting for Jesus Christ every single day as if it were the last day. So would you stand with me right now?